Well, good morning. Welcome this morning to Cornerstone Family Worship. If you guys would go ahead and stand with us, we're going to begin our uh, our worship time this morning.
three days later that they made the announcement of Tyson. It's a way to ruin a good mayor's prayer breakfast. <clears throat> but that's going to be Saturday, May 5th, and it'll begin at 8.30. Tickets will be available out at the uh, Welcome Center information desk on your left. Last thing, if you have a graduating high school uh, senior or college student getting ready to graduate, please write that in on the bottom of your Connect card, turn that in. We'll have a graduation day coming up and uh, would like to honor them and their achievements. I got, I got more, but it's gonna be later. So let's all stand together. If you know this, this, this church and our, our process here, we always make sure in this second set of songs that we are able to pray for one another. So if you have needs, if you just would like for somebody to pray with you, our elders are going to come to the front. They're going to be on either side here. Um, maybe you don't want to come up front. Uh, grab one of these elders after service. Get in touch with us. If you don't feel like you have a need, there are people with needs around you right now. Just begin to pray for other people as we enter into some more worship uh, and just a time of prayer. Father, we, we seriously honor you. And we want to make it all about you. But we recognize the needs of your people. We're asking God that as voices are lifted, as hearts are open, that you would hear from heaven, that you would honor the requests. Let your healing touch be upon the lives of men. Let your grace overflow in their hearts. We ask it in Jesus' name.
we stand but barely before you Father in, in adoration and in worship in appreciation knowing God that that name that name is above everything that name is is powerful than more powerful than any armies of the world that name is more powerful than 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 we can even imagine but yet even in our weakness sometimes we're so full of pride that we don't call on that name father today would you help us to understand in a deeper way that you truly are for us and not against us. That you are our friend, not our foe. That, that, that your power is available to us when we call on that wonderful name of Jesus. God, thank you. Thank you for such a privilege to gather and worship you this morning. Thank you, Father, that that name is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Thank you. Thank you, Father. We are truly in awe of you today. And Father, with those, I pray for those this morning with, with, uh, with needs, those who are sick and need healing, Father. There are many. I, I have a few. Helen Nelson, God, we lift her up to you for Melanie for Kelly, for Eileen, and Father, all those others that are on the lips of your people here this morning. God, we ask for healing and strength and wholeness through the holy name of our Lord Jesus. Bring your healing, Lord, from that very throne of grace. Have your way. We love you. We give you honor and praise today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand before you see it, if you would. Uh, as I said earlier, um, the, the first thing I'd like to do is have Paul just talk to you just a second about this app, uh, Cornerstone app, so that you're kind of on the same page. If you have any questions, you know, try to catch one of us after. So, not me. One of the people that know stuff. Uh, and, and you can ask your questions at that time, though. Okay. Real quick, how many of you have a smartphone? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. Come on. Guys. All right. How many of you have a Cornerstone Family app? Ooh, I see a lot of hands that are down. All right, so we have a Cornerstone Family app at the, uh, uh, if you have an Android, whatever that inferior technology is. Or if you have an iPhone, you can go to the app store with the iPhone and get that. And so that's being updated continually um, each week. And right now you'll be able to see some of the information about the youth and the kids program. And it has links to um, the individual Facebook pages, has links to the service today on YouTube. So you can go back and listen or see what that's about. Or I guess both since it's on YouTube. And um, there's also some connection in there for the uh, giving that's electronic. And we have a new, we'll talk more about this later, but we have a new fund that's um, been put in place. It's impact offering, so it's above your tithe. And Pastor Ron will talk about that in the future weeks, but that is also on here too. And uh, so check it out, events, notifications, all the good stuff that happens week to week right here. Yeah. Good call, Ian. He works a lot on that stuff. And uh, I ask questions, and I don't even understand the answers. I really don't understand the questions, but I throw it out there just to get... Uh, Sherry, where's Chris? Is he out here? Come on, Chris. There he is. Give Chris and Sherry a hand as they come up here. I need a mic. White. <laughs> Age group from like 
20s, 30-ish, even if like your 40s and you have kids and families, please feel free to come. Um, it is in your bulletin right here. It is on the back of your encounter card, please. It's number two, so please check in and fill it out. And I also have you to fill that out as well. We're just trying to get an idea of who's going to come, and that way we can make sure we have plenty of food. And this is open to even bring your children. We would love to have everybody and just have a great time to fellowship. Thank you. Can I stay in too? Can, can I? Stay? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so rejected right now. <laughs> Uh, one last thing before before we get into today's uh, message. Um, if you ran 13.1 miles yesterday, would you please stand? Come on, if you can. If... Maggie, Shauna, Ron, Sarah, anybody else? You guys did great. I just, I just, that's just so wonderful. Wait, go guys. <laughs> I was cheering you on. From oh, home. Gosh. <laughs> That's a big deal. It really is a big deal. Um, today I want to talk again on the subject of risen. If you have your Bibles, what I'd like for you to do, if you would, is turn to Acts chapter 1. Because I believe it's a good starting place for this. If you are part of the leadership here, I think it was, I looked it up, and not everybody agrees with me on this date. It was October of 2016 that I actually spoke on this subject. Because of its importance. I also know that in 2017, I started the year talking about kingdom culture. And, and there's a lot of this that may sound familiar to you, but I think we have to have it. Where we are right now, I think we all need this. Uh, I want to talk about the kingdom connection today. And, and that is the idea that when we connect ourselves to the kingdom of God, life changes. Say amen. amen. Life changes. There's a whole lot of things that people deal with, struggle with, go through in this life that they never quite seem to make the connection with God that transforms their life, their nature, their attitude. I mean, you know anybody that could use a good attitude adjustment? <laughs> Point out. <laughs> I like that sharing this. Acts chapter 1, verse 1. says the former treatise or account I made of Theopolis of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. Look at this verse. To whom he also presented himself alive, which we talked about last week, alive and revived. I mean, uh, come alive. And I believe when the Spirit of God is in you and when you know salvation and you know heaven is coming, I think you can come alive. And I think that's what he's expecting of us. And there's too many, there's too many Christians who understand the thing about salvation and they even have a hope for heaven, but they never really come alive in this life. I'll tell you what, I think my voice is getting better since it's only one sermon on Sunday morning, so y'all better look out. <laughs> to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to what? Kingdom of the God. kingdom of God. This is about the kingdom. If we could boil down the priority that Jesus had with his disciples after the resurrection, which is part of our title, after uh, the resurrection, the risen part uh, of the ministry of Jesus, if we could boil all that down and, and what he taught his disciples and work, what he worked with his disciples on, we would conclude that his, the message that he gave was about the kingdom of God. The kingdom connection. We were, I could start this whole thing out with, with just a question. And I, I want you to think about this, not necessarily in terms of yourself, but of so many others that you might know. Why is it that there are so many people that leave the church? I don't mean this church. I mean any church. What is it that causes people to give up on church? Because, you know, we think that the church is a building, but really the church is us, the body of Christ as a whole. And yet some people get so frustrated, even in the 
early days or months or years of their of their Christianity, their salvation experience, that they just walk away. How many times have we seen it here? Where people uh, in, with tears give their life to Christ and make a commitment. And I hear them say it one-on-one uh, -on -one so many times. I, I'm here. I'm in. This is, this is God for me. I'm doing this. And then two months later, you can't find it. What is it that causes that to happen? Could it be they don't feel like they really fit in? They don't feel like they made any friends or could it be some financial need that they had that the church was not able to fulfill? I mean, what, what, could, what could it be? I've, I've heard all kinds of stuff. I'm sure that you have too. Maybe, maybe some people would say, well, it's the songs. It's the songs they sing over there. <laughs> Did anybody else in here enjoy that last song? Amen. Yeah, yeah. yeah sure. I mean, it kind of takes... Four more. Isn't that, isn't that what that is? Isn't that a way that we connect with the kingdom of God when we have worship? It's from the heart. Uh, honestly, again, there are a thousand reasons why people leave one church, go to another church, or just quit church altogether. We'll never be able to stop that from happening with some people. But what we can do is establish who we are in the kingdom. And we can work ourselves and help others to build a connection with the kingdom of God. And I think that's our priority. I think that's something we have to... Y'all remind me not to do that. Who does that remind you of? Don't say it. <laughs> remind me not to do that or this. Oh. <laughs> if I do that, you can... <clears throat> so I'll remember. That's what you get. Um, we should be able to do this. We should be more focused on... We should be more focused on helping other people establish a connection with the kingdom of God. It should, it should uh, uh, invade our mind every part of the day. I mean, how many times you just stop in the middle of the day and you think, well, there's, some, there's somebody that needs God. Thank you for the one flat. <laughs> I actually had an itch that time. How many times and how many people do you know at work? Or in your family. That you know they need something that would connect them with God in a more clear way. Or connect them with the kingdom of God in a more clear way. Why don't we think about that more? Why don't we work a little harder at making that happen? And so I'm going to give you a couple of things here that might help you think in that direction. So Roman number one here is keeping the main thing the main thing. We often get distracted and pulled away and turned away by those things that do not connect with the kingdom of God. How many things do you do on a routine basis that do not connect with the kingdom of God? Somebody was laughing at me the other day because you're always talking about drivers. You know, I don't know that that really connects with it. But uh, Michelle sent me a picture. I, it's not out there, is it? No. And, and it's one that I've thought a lot about. And basically on the back... Uh, glass of, of a car it has an arrow and this says slower traffic, keep right with an arrow Amen. left lane passing only, fast lane and I'm thinking I'm thinking I'm going to put that on my truck <laughs> but the big, the big problem is though is what do you do for those people in front of you that are going too slow and, and have you blocked no you put it in little bitty print then you get that close to their bumper so they can see it and everything. No, I'm just kidding. But it's easy for us to get distracted. I mean, how many times have we allowed some little bitty tiny thing to just totally disrupt our connection with the kingdom? We're doing fine. We're, we're, we're having a wonderful time. It's in, early in the morning and we spend our time with God and we spend our time in prayer. And then we get out into the world and sometimes it's just a real small thing that gets us disconnected. We lose sight. Of the main thing. The kingdom of God must be the main thing. That's what Jesus was, was dealing out to the disciples in Acts chapter 1. He taught them. He, he enlightened them. He instructed them on issues concerning the kingdom. We need to keep focus. At the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he was in the synagogue and was given 
a scroll of the book of Isaiah and he turned to the place where it was written in Luke chapter 4 verse 18. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable day of the Lord. Jesus answers a couple of questions for all of us in terms of the ministry of the kingdom. And that is when the spirit of the Lord is upon you, you are anointed. Amen. Now, I, I know that many of you came from churches and backgrounds where we don't talk about anointing where we came from. We don't talk about the spirit of the Lord that much either. It was God the Father, God the Son, and what's his name? That's the way that some people have looked at that in the past. But look, I, I, I want to tell you. Um, the Bible even says in, in Romans 8, if any man does not have the spirit of Christ, who's talking about the Holy Spirit, he says he is none of his. The Holy Spirit is given to us when we receive Christ. The Holy Spirit is real. It's not an it. He, he's not a that. He, he is a person. He is a part of the Trinity. He's part of the Godhead. And where the Holy Spirit is and where the Holy Spirit is working, there will be an anointing. You are anointed if you have given your life to Christ and you are surrendered to the will and the direction and that kingdom connection, you have an anointing on your life. Amen. Right. Now, what you do with that is going to be up to you. God doesn't overpower you and force you. The phrase, preach the gospel. Wait, where am I at? Oh, I got it. This is, this is hard. I know this is going to be the anointing that I'm just talking about is for preaching. And, and I know how people respond to that. They say, well, I'm not a preacher. Um, you may not be a preacher. You may not stand in front of the church and preach, or you may not stand in front of the Sunday school class and teach. You may not have any of those venues where you're like in charge and you're teaching other people. But listen, in every one of our lives, if we have given our life to Christ, we are preaching. We are sharing with other people. Other people are going to see and know that, that the Holy Spirit is in us. The truth is we are all made ministers of the gospel. Amen. 2 Corinthians 3, 6. We are all ministers of the gospel. We've all been called to do something for God. We may not, again, be the ones who stand and preach. If you have the Holy Spirit... You have the anointing for something. Um, you're, you are, and you're preaching everywhere you go. You know, you may not believe it, but you're preaching when you're at work. You say, well, I don't even get to talk when I'm at work. You're still preaching. You're preaching a message. And I haven't heard anybody say uh, lately that uh, preach always and use words if necessary. We are always preaching a message. We're always demonstrating the gospel and we, we have to know that. We have to realize that. <clears throat> Keeping the main thing the main thing. So number one here, the main thing is, is the ministry of the gospel. In uh, Mark chapter 16 verse 14 it said that Jesus, and I, I went over this last week, this is where Jesus appeared to the disciples and he rebuked them. Right? He said, shame on you for not believing. When you were told that I was raised from the dead, you didn't believe. Shame on you for that. But he didn't leave it there, right? He, he turned right around then and said, so get up and go preach the gospel. And this is exactly what God does with us. Now, we have our times of unbelief. We've gone through that. You probably haven't. I haven't at different times in my life, in my ministry. I struggle sometimes with, with believing uh, uh, all that God is wanting and able and willing to do. But, and, and if you don't think that you struggle with belief, you're, you're not being very realistic with yourself. There are those times where we're just not sure. I just, I just don't know. I, I'm not sure what God is doing. I'm not sure what God is up to. But listen, God's not telling you you're done. He's not telling you I don't like you anymore. He's not telling you, I don't love you. you. You doubt too much. What he's saying is, stop it. <laughs> stop doubting. Start believing and get up and go preach the gospel. Amen. 
That's exactly what he's saying to his disciples. All four gospel accounts end with Jesus giving his disciples the main thing. In Matthew, he said, go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. In the book of Mark, he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. In Luke, he said, repentance and remission of sins should be preached in Christ's name among all nations. In John, it was a little bit different, but it's still the same message. He said, if you love me, feed my sheep. Preach the gospel. The gospel is the main thing. Romans 1.16, Paul's conclusion was this. It should be our conclusion also, and that is the, the, a connection to the kingdom. When he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greeks. The gospel literally means good news. When he talks about the gospel, he's not talking about you having to memorize the Romans Road. How many of you know the Romans Road? Good information to have. It's great information to have. He's not talking about the four steps of spirituality or, 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 or seven steps to witnessing or any, any of that. It, the, he's talking about the good news. The gospel is good news. And once you get that in your mind, once you understand something about, you know, I, I get to talk to some older folks occasionally. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, I go and, and do a Bible study and get to talk to people in their, I, I always tell them they're like in their late 60s, you know. And, but you know what, when you get that age, they always correct you, uh-uh, I'm 97. <laughs> Don't you love that? Uh, I'm 94. And, and one of the ladies the other day, she was not willing to tell. She was just not willing to tell. But she was holding it so everybody was listening at the same time. And then she said she was 98, I think, turning 98. When I talk to those people, it's amazing to me how people lose their faith over the years. I, I try to encourage them to believe, trust God. If you had any idea what you were leaving here and going to there, we all would be standing in a line somewhere trying to get out of here. Don't fear death. Don't fear that time of transition. There's something that God has done there to help build inside of us a kingdom connection. Part of that is seeing the reality of heaven and our future. Don't quit believing. Don't stop believing. Keep your focus on the main thing. Keep, keep doing it. Good news is about what God has done and what God is willing to do. And anybody in this church has a testimony to share with somebody else. A testimony of God's goodness and God's grace. We lose sight of that sometimes. We, we miss it. We let it go. And we, I'm not going to go around the room this morning, but I've seen some of the great things that God has done in many of your lives. I, I heard Lisa and some of the other ladies talking about their women's ministry meeting last Tuesday night. And some of the, the testimonies that were shared in there. I, it made me cry. I wasn't even there. They don't let me come anymore because they have food, and I they don't. They just they just don't let me. And look, you all. We all have a testimony. We all have something. Build on that. That's that was what connected you to the kingdom of God. Is giving you something to share with somebody else. Look at the good news and keep the good news in mind. That's the gospel. You don't have to fight over all the things that we don't know the answer to. Give them the good news. Secondly, number two, the gospel is always about people and not programs. Years ago in this church, we started talking about transitional ages because every church that I've ever been a part of, you know, they have it over the Sunday school classroom. It says ages... Four to six. And you don't, you know, have mercy on you if you have a seven-year-old child and you try to get him into that class. Because it's about the program, right? And, and we started talking about transitional ages and giving the parents a better, uh, a little more of a, of a grasp on that. So that, you know, there may be some uh, five-year-olds that should be in the first grade class or whatever, whatever it is. We don't have to be so stringent on stuff like that. There are some kids that are ready to move up. And there are some kids who are not ready to move up, even though their age says that they are, and their parents want to keep them back. 
but we're going to be flexible on that, that type of stuff. Well, there's also transitional connections to the kingdom of God. Just because you think you've been a Christian for 10 years, doesn't don't be disappointed in yourself if you don't have all the answers yet. And if you've only been a Christian for a year, don't be disappointed if somebody asks you something and you don't know the answer to it. We, we have to deal with this in little bits and pieces and stages as we go. We, we can't all be the same. You can't make a square cookie with a round cookie cutter. Right? We're not all going to be the same, and we don't have to, to be the same. We work together as the body of Christ, and we encourage one another, and we try to strengthen each other where we are. You know, in our worship, there have been times where we made some, some uh, uh, transitional uh, decisions in worship. And, you know, it's not, so, it's not because we don't like the music or the people or the instruments or the whatever. Sometimes we, we, we make uh, transitional connections in order to get people out of their own comfort zone. In order to get people out of their little box that they've built for themselves over the last 10, 15, 20 years. And you say, I'm a Christian. I always have been. Always will be. But this is where I draw a line. I'm in this box. It's my box. You leave me alone. And sometimes you have to help people make a transition out of that. And, and I can't do it. It's not my job to force that. But when you start allowing people to make a connection with the kingdom of God at a, at a greater level. I believe God himself is wanting to pull people out of their little man-made box and get them to think in a little more about the kingdom of God and what the kingdom can do for themselves and for people around them. God is not done with you yet. Have you heard that lately? I know you sometimes feel like you get into a rut and it's all just the same. I... I mean, how many times have you woke up in the morning and you think, you know, it's just another day. And, and, and you know, I, I got I to get up and do the same thing, same routine. And I got to go to work and I got to see the same people and I got to do the same job. And it's just going to be another boring day. No, you need to add some life to your life. Amen. Connect yourself with the kingdom of God and let him start doing some new things in you. Look for the opportunities that God uh, affords you. God is going to give you some opportunities. If you're willing, if you're willing to connect with God in a new way, in a fresh way, God will give you some opportunities to minister to some people, to meet some needs, to have some new adventures and some new challenges and trust Him and, and have faith in what He has said and who He has said you are and things will begin to change. You don't have to be Bored and, and, and hesitant to start another thing. I'm just so tired of the same old thing. Can I share something personal with you? Lisa gets the coffee ready at night, but not totally. She puts the water in the coffee pot. <laughs> and sometimes she'll put the filter in there and put coffee in there, but she never pours the water in there. And you know, I can tell my attitude when I get up and I go into the kitchen and I think, she didn't pour the water in there again. I got to uh, pour me. I got to pour all the water into the coffee pot. <laughs> I, isn't that right? And push the button. How many things do you have in your routine that you think, well, that's just it? <laughs> she wakes up, I'm going to give her a piece of my mind today. Just pour it. I mean, do you have any of those things? Come on. Get a grip. Make a connection with God before you ever get out of bed. And allow God to make some new things happen. Whatever you have to do. Whatever you, whatever you do during your day. Do it as unto the Lord. Remember, the Bible says that. Do it as unto the Lord and be the best doer of it you can be. Absolutely. Pour this water in here with a smile on my face. <laughs> Bless God, I might even sing. I might sing loud enough to wake her up. <laughs> we rode together today. <laughs> I have the only key to my truck. <laughs> 
she might want you to take her. No. I'm just saying, we all have those things. And when you get up in the morning and you want to point out something that just isn't the way that you want it to be, look, do it. Just, just do it. Do it for, for God's sake. God, I'm going to do this and I'm going to, I'm, going to, I'm going to give you my best attitude in the process of it. You get on the highway in the morning, put, put some words of praise on your lips. Pray for somebody you know. <clears throat> give God an opportunity to work some new stuff in you. When preaching the gospel as the main thing, we become all things to all people. Your connection to the kingdom must be transitional. You are not who you once were. Your priorities change. Your convictions lead to transition for life. Your convictions will lead you to transitions. Paul said it like this. In 1 Corinthians 9, 19, he said, Though I be free from all men, yet I have made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. To the Jews I become as Jews. Those that are under the law I become as one under the law. Uh, those that are without the law as without the law, being not without the law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without the law. And then verse 22, he says, To the weak become I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake. That I might be partaker of the gospel with you. We are in this together. We don't, we don't have to lord ourselves over anybody. And I know every one of you knows somebody you're better than. At least in your mind. We don't have to remind them of that. We don't have to... Our goal is not to point that out. Our goal is not to make people aware of the fact that I'm just better. <laughs> I look better. I sound better. I'm smarter. I got more hair. It's not any great feat for some of us. We don't have, that's not the point. We are in this together. We are partakers of the gospel with each other. There's a principle in, in what Paul is telling us. You may feel like you're, you're free from all men in terms of their opinion and their judgment. Uh, and my, my relationship with God is between me and God. And that's true. But he was excusing himself from any man-made program of religion and, religion and attaching himself to the soul of others. This is what you're saying. I don't need to be anything other than what you need me to be in the moment in order to win you to Christ, to share with you the gospel, to see some greater things happening for you, in you, and then through you. He wasn't assigning any list of rules or, or any preconceived expectation of conformity. He's just allowing the power of the gospel to transform other people to obedience because it's the gospel that will change people. It's the Holy Spirit that will change people. How many people have you fixed? It's not our responsibility to fix. It's our responsibility to share with them the gospel. So to be a partaker of the gospel with others like Paul said that he was uh, to reap the benefit and the blessing and the privilege of the gospel, Paul said, I make myself a servant to all. This is the place of pleasing God and his uh, righteous command to go and preach, go and teach. Because at the core of the gospel, it's not just about me. It's about us. It, it's about sharing the gospel with somebody else. It's about all of us together. Number three, kingdom connection or culture promotes a zeal to serve. As, as the Holy Spirit is, so we should become. What the Holy Spirit does in us and for us, he should also do through us. We should become more uh, um, easily used by the Holy Spirit. 
following our own desires or personal preference or expectations is not about kingdom connection. It's about gratifying self-righteousness. It, uh, it, it's to make myself feel better about me. And then our world is full of that these days, isn't it? I mean, you you want to you be a number one bestseller? Tell people how to feel better about themselves. You take out all of the, the laws. You take out all of the morals. You take out all the ethics and, and just focus on telling people how to think more positively of themselves. Get up in the morning and go to your mirror and say, you sure are good looking today. <laughs> Point to yourself and you are a winner. A winner. Well, you're a wiener. <laughs> now, I mean, haven't you heard this? Haven't you heard this? There's a lot of this kind of talk out there today. So just the power of persuasion and convincing yourself that you're something pretty special. You are special. But listen, that only really... Uh, dawns on the mind and the soul in a real way when it's connected to the kingdom of God and His Word and His promises. Learn who you are in Him. Romans chapter 10, verse 3, actually verse, in verse 2, he's talking about those who have a zeal. They're excited, they're, they're passionate, but it's a zeal without knowledge. It's, it's a zeal apart from a kingdom connection. And he says in verse 3 that they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Christ is the end of the law. Uh, there are people who are exciting and, and they're fun and they're um, you know, always happy and, and but listen without that kingdom connection there you never really connect with the righteousness that God wants to give you and, and, and that righteousness only comes through Christ zeal represents all those religious ideas that people stand up for and impose on others which is confusing personal conviction with a kingdom connection we are living in a, in a generation that is very confused about the difference between personal conviction and a kingdom connection. We got lots of people running around telling other people what they should do. Well, God don't like you doing that. God don't want you doing that. God is mad at you because you did this. That's personal conviction. Personal conviction really doesn't have any authority and I don't believe personal conviction really carries a whole lot of weight with the Holy Spirit when we're laying it off on somebody else like it's the law of the Medes and the Persians. You, you may have grown up to where this is what we do, this is what we don't do, and anything outside of what we do and what we don't do must be wrong because we didn't do it. <laughs> that's not a kingdom connection. That's a personal conviction. Find the laws, find the rules, find the principles in the word, and then find a way to share that with the person who needs it through love and grace and anointing, and you're doing some good. Anything out of personal conviction is only for yourself and not for them. I'm just going to skip all of that right there. Is that Okay. Um, when we force our ideas of righteousness on others so that I feel good to make me feel I and mean, you've seen this I know you've seen this well I, I just have to tell them how I feel no you don't you don't I, I just I just need to give them a piece of my mind no no you don't you need to hold on to that more than likely, you're going to give them a piece that you really can't live without. But people do that sort of stuff, and then they get the idea that I'm really fulfilling the purpose of God because I'm pointing out everything that they're doing wrong. That's, that's not what God has called you to do. We got that part yet? God has called us to share the good news of the gospel 
with those who are in need. To make a, a, the kind of connection to the kingdom of God that flows through our life and other people can see that and then ask the questions concerning how we got to where we are. I mean, we do have something to offer other people. Um, what was the, uh, the priority of the incarnate Son of God on this earth? In Acts chapter 10, verse 38, it said, God anointed, there's the anointing again, Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. If you're connected to the kingdom, God is with you. Your life and your anointing is about healing, not hurting. When we see other people and the pain that they might be in, it's, our job is healing. Our responsibility is healing, not hurting more. It's about providing peace, not more persecution. The world doesn't really need any more persecution. They really don't need persecution from inside the church. Church people don't need persecution from other church people. What they need to know is how can I get the peace of God in my life? Yeah, it might be that you need to fix some stuff, but you, know, you don't think the Holy Spirit's already talking to them about that? That's, right. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. We are, uh, uh, if you're connected uh, with God, then do good. Don't groan. Do good. That's what they said Jesus did. He went about doing good. It didn't say that he went about groaning, grumbling, complaining. Do good. You know, we overcome evil in this world. You know how we overcome evil? By being mean. No, that's not what the Bible says. We overcome evil by doing good. The good things that you do, the good things of the gospel will overcome the evil that is around you. If you will exercise that connection with the kingdom. God, okay. So he, he is saying in, in Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to. Right? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So if you seek the right things more than anything else. There will be a lot of stuff you don't have to worry about. If you seek the kingdom of God first. You don't need to be stressed out. Over every little thing that comes down the pipe. Actually, you don't have to be stressed out about anything. You don't have to be upset. Uh, you, don't have to, you don't have to lay awake at night wondering who's going to win the election. Or what is going to be on the news tomorrow morning. Look, seek first the kingdom of God. God's going to straighten some things out. For you, in you, and through you. Last point, number four. Uh, kingdom connection or kingdom culture should come natural to us. Now... I, I, again, I talk about this, and, and Michelle says it should say kingdom culture should come naturally to us. And, and both ways are right. If you're from further south, <laughs> you don't need the L-Y. <clears throat> oh, wait, two L's. Yeah, the L-Y. No. <laughs> Understand the point. Because we think, we get the idea sometimes, well... Uh, you know, well, I just had never learned that. Nobody's ever taught me that. Did you know that the things that God has put in you, if you give your life to Christ, you get the Holy Spirit, right? Yes. Are you in agreement with that? Yes. Let's, say you're, let's say you're filled with the Holy Spirit, but you get the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has a, a job and a purpose uh, inside of each one of us. And part of that is teaching us truth. Here Romans 15, 14. Worship team, if y'all would come back. Paul said, I am persuaded of you, my brethren, that you are also full of goodness, filled with knowledge, and also able to admonish or encourage one another. This, this was written to the church at Rome, which are Gentiles, who at that time did not have the written word of God. They didn't have a Bible. Uh, it was like us, us sending um, a letter about our church culture to a Mormon tabernacle somewhere. I mean, they, they did not get this. They didn't have the Bible. Paul was not with them all the time teaching them. He was saying, I'm convinced that the Holy Spirit has already been working on you uh, and, and caused you to be full of goodness, filled with knowledge, 
able to encourage and all that, uh, that without Paul ha having been overly involved. They got it naturally because they got the Holy Spirit. I know we need to teach and we need to grow and we need to be more specific about the things that we learn and the things that we share. But listen, what he's telling us here is the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth. Yes. The Holy Spirit will cause you to know some things naturally. Now, we're trying to make it too complicated too, too often. Well, well which, which should I do this or should I do this or should I do that? There's a lot of that stuff God has left up to you to decide. Well, I need, I just, I've been pray, I've been praying about whether to go 2440 to work or go down and hit I-70. I've been praying about it for three weeks, and so I haven't gone to work yet. I've just been praying about it. I've just been praying about which way to go. I can help you make that easier. Leah, which way do you go? Oh, never mind. You live in basement. I-70. 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 You'll say, whichever way Leah goes, go the other way. <laughs> She's fun. <laughs> um, I got a tech. Never mind. <laughs> Ooh, no. Listen, this is what the Holy Spirit is all about. Don't get so caught up in those things. Connect yourself with the kingdom of God and the principles of God's kingdom because He's wanting. He's wanting to make that stuff known to you. Uh, God wants to speak through us, and the Holy Spirit makes that happen. In Matthew 10, verse 19, it says, When uh, they deliver you up, Jesus talking, when they, when they capture you and take you in, don't, don't be so worried and stressed out about what you're going to speak. For it shall be given you in that same hour what you shall speak. For it is not you that speaks, but the Spirit of your Father which speaks in you. He, he's saying, I'm going to give you the words that you need. You ever just done this? Pray before you go to work. God, there's going to be somebody there that has a need today, and I'm going to ask you to speak through me what your Holy Spirit would reveal. It, it's amazing. How many of you have ever done that, and it's actually, like, worked? No, there, yeah, there's a lot more, whether you know it or not. God will give you the words that you need if you'll put yourself out there and trust Him to speak through your life. In John 14, 16, the Holy Spirit is called the Comforter, the one who walks beside the paraclete, and He gives peace, and He gives purpose, and He gives direction. And, and it also says he will not only dwell with you, he shall be in you. And that he will teach you, in, in John 14, 16, he will teach you all things. The Holy Spirit will help you to understand stuff. To help you know things. And we just have to trust and believe. John 15 says the Holy Spirit will testify of Jesus. You know, have you ever, have you been one of those people in your past at some point that have said, I just, I read the Bible, but I don't get it. The Holy Spirit is the one that will give it to you. He will teach you of Jesus. John 16 says he's convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And he also says in John 16 that he will guide you into all truth and that he will show you things to come. The Holy Spirit is what will give you that connection to the kingdom of God in a way that now you don't have to suffer through life. You can be risen with Christ, as he said, and you can live life to the fullest. Amen. If you're ready for that, stand with me. <clears throat> Instruction, the direction, the power, the relationship with God and the Holy Spirit is the main thing. Bow your heads with me if you would. I'm going to come back in just a moment and close. We're going to sing this song together. But if you're in here today and you know you need something else, something different, something more, you're not sure what that is, but you're willing to ask. I believe the answer is the Holy Spirit. I believe it begins when you acknowledge the fact that you need that connection with the kingdom of God. That's you. I want you to just slip up your hand right where you are and say, pray for me, Pastor Ron. I need this life. I bless you. I, do. I need this connection with the kingdom of God. Anybody else, just pray for me. God bless you, man. I see you. I see you. Come on, I see you. Anybody else, come on. I, I need God. I need God to be more real. I need to make a, a connection with his kingdom that changes my life Right here, right now, I see you, sister. God bless you. I see you. Anybody else? Come on.
Just pray for me, Pastor Ron. I'm ready. Today's my day. I'm going to rise. I'm going to rise in the newness of who Christ has made me to be. I'm going to walk this life as one risen from the dead. I'm going to connect with the kingdom of God in a way that not only affects the way that I live, but it affects those around me. And I want it to start right now. Slip up your hand. Come on, anybody else? Father, I'm asking in these next few moments, anybody willing, brave enough to step out and just ask for your Holy Spirit. They would do that as our elders come to the front. God, that you would strengthen every person in this room. Let them know this is not just some pretend thing. It's not just another sermon. This is a day of new beginning. A day of a new second chance. Guide us in these moments to come. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. In this time of desperation, when all we know is doubt and fear, there is only one foundation. We believe. This broken generation When all is dark You help us see There is only one salvation We believe We believe We believe Oh,
They also have these blue envelopes with a little card in there, phone number in there, a couple of things. All you need to do is pick up one of those cards. If you'd like to stop and pray with one of them, they'd love to pray with you, pray for you, or to pray again with you concerning somebody else in your life or in your family. Take just a couple of minutes and do that on your way out today. God bless you. We appreciate you being here. Join with me in prayer. Father, we thank you that your Holy Spirit still speaks, still speaks to us. That you are alive and well and you've caused us to be risen with you, to live a new life in this world according to the connection we have with your kingdom. Be alive in us. Let your Holy Spirit work in and through us new, greater ways. God, I ask your blessings on every person in this room. That you take them from where they are right now to that next step, that next greater thing that you've called them to. For some, it might be raising them from the, the deadness of themselves and their past. Bring them into newness of life. God, I ask your blessings on this communion and those who partake of it today. Watch over and protect each of these. Till we come back together again. We ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 God bless you. Give the Lord a hand one more time.